Oh, yeah. Welcome to the first installment of our 2021-2022 Innovation Leader Speaker Series. My name is Carrie Slade. I'm an assistant professor at the Fox School of Temple University and the assistant academic director of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute. I'm so thrilled to welcome you to our first event, the first Eating the Slow, Lean in Innovation in Large Enterprises. And I'm so excited to have two speakers from Procter & Gamble here, Carl Frake, who recently retired after a long career with Procter & Gamble, most recently as Senior Director of Product Supply and Open Innovation. Also joining us is his colleague, Karen Hershenson, Innovation Director at GrowthWorks, which is Procter & Gamble's initiative to bring lean, the lean methodology to the entire organization. I can tell you I've talked with the speakers a couple times, I've looked at their slides. This is gonna be a really packed presentation full of amazing tips and ways to create more innovation, whether you're an entrepreneur or working in corporate America. All right, I'm gonna share my screen for one moment so I can give you some announcements. Hopefully you can see my presentation. Oops, here we go. First, I wanna thank our sponsors. We have a great team of people working on this series this year, and I'm really thankful for our team, including people from the Center for Student Professional Development, as well as alumni relations. So I really appreciate everyone's help in putting these events together, including Lindsay Clark and her team of student workers. We also wanna thank our sponsors, Technically Philly. You can sign up to get more information uh, when you register. The Innovation Research Interchange. As some of you may know, Procter & Gamble is an IRI member, so a special welcome to any IRI members on the call today. And the Product Development and Management Association of Philadelphia, a special welcome to any PDMA members as well. This series grew out of our um, Innovation Management Entrepreneurship Master's degree. We teach a lot in our courses about practical applications of innovation principles in entrepreneurship and in, in corporate settings. And we wanted to bring that outside of our courses and our classroom and bring it to the larger community and also integrate more community knowledge into our, into our practices. So that's where this series comes around. But if this webinar is not enough for you and you want more information on innovation and entrepreneurship, you can sign up to get a master's degree. It's only 10 classes, one year full-time or two years part-time. Or if you don't have that much time, you can just take three classes and get a graduate certificate in any of the topics you see there. So if you have any questions about that, you know who to contact. Also save the date for our next ILSS event. This is co-sponsored with Temple's Social Entrepreneurship Programs led by Professor Alan Kersner. Um, so we're bringing innovation and social impact together in this event to feature Matt Dwyer, VP of Product Impact and Innovation at Patagonia. So we'll be sending out that invitation shortly. If you'd like to get involved in supporting us, you can review submissions for our business competitions, you can mentor teams, or you can just come to our events. We have several events throughout the year that are like live Shark Tank style pitch competitions with students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and they're really exciting and interesting to watch. So please scan that code or you can contact me or Lindsay Clark. And we do hope you will join us for networking after the program. Um, the Remo platform is really cool and that allows you just to double click and move to a different table. If you don't wanna be seen, turn your camera and your mic off. If you wanna be seen, turn them on. And if you hit tile view at the bottom left, it'll make everyone a little bit bigger for you. I also hope you'll fill out our survey at the end because we care about your opinion. We wanna get uh, opinions about how we can improve these events or what you liked about them and how it's made an impact in, in your life or your work. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna introduce our speakers. So again, for nearly 35 years, Carl Frake has been working at Procter & Gamble. He first started in supply chain and operations and most recently served as senior director of product supply and open innovation at P&G Ventures. He has a wide range of experience, including disruptive innovation, supply chain, manufacturing, fulfillment, and planning. His work has also spanned four countries, including the US, China, Ukraine, and Singapore. And he received his BS in industrial engineering from the University in Cincinnati. I'm also especially excited to announce that he recently joined our faculty in our innovation management program, 
teaching about open innovation and strategic alliances. So if there's any graduate students at Temple on this call, um, definitely sign up for calls class and it's open to IME students, MBAs, any graduate student really. Uh, also joining us is Karen Hershenson. Super excited to have her because she leads the GrowthWorks team, which as I mentioned, is the Procter & Gamble's initiative to bring lean startup approaches to the entire organization to promote disruptive thinking and entrepreneurial thinking. This initiative was started in 2016 and it's been lauded as one of the fastest culture change efforts at Procter & Gamble. Karen has guided teams from every business unit to deliver innovative solutions grounded in deep human insights. And prior to the creation of GrowthWorks, Karen uh, led the Clay Street Project, which was an innovation incubator at Procter & Gamble. And before her innovation career at Procter & Gamble, she enjoyed a successful 15-year marketing career at Coca-Cola and Mattel. Karen is a graduate of Southern, uh, University of Southern California, where she received her MBA, and Penn State, where she got her undergraduate degree. So welcome, Carl and Karen. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this and sharing your knowledge with our community. So first, I'd like to start with an open-ended question. Tell us anything you think we should know about your background that maybe I didn't mention and how you started working in lean innovation. Carl, let's start with you. Sure. Um, the first 30 years I was with uh, Procter & Gamble, I um, was <clears throat> focused on our supply chain uh, operations. And as time went on, I uh, rose in the ranks of leadership and ended up not only with supply chain responsibilities, but also with innovation responsibilities as they related to the integration of the innovation with it actually being delivered to the marketplace. And through that time and actually being based in four different countries during that part of my career, I considered myself to be what I call a victim of innovation. And what I meant by that was there would be decisions being made um, by our central uh, business unit innovation um, networks that didn't have uh, the necessary local uh, consumer knowledge um, to really be able to maximize the benefit of the innovation. And that caused major issues um, for our go-to-market capabilities at a local level and um, didn't allow us to to really get the, the benefits, the revenue benefits, the, uh, the, the consumer delight that we were looking for, for our innovation. And so um, as I was coming back from my last international assignment in Singapore, I had the opportunity to join Procter & Gamble Ventures, um, which is completely focused on lean innovation and take all of those um, learnings and really help the organization to um, drive uh, the, the consumer at the center, um, which has had a massive uh, impact, as well as uh, the methodologies that we're gonna talk about here in a couple of minutes around um, running small experiments to prove out um, hypotheses that we have so that we're not over investing at the beginning and we're really delivering consumer delight, not only on the technical side, but with the communication of the consumer and really learning from the consumer um, this is, has made a, a big difference and it's just been a delight that I was able to spend the last five years of my career really reinventing myself from an innovation standpoint as the company reinvented it itself from an innovation standpoint. That's great. Yeah, it's interesting how the innovation practices actually have a personal effect on you as well in terms of open-mindedness and creativity. Great, Karen, what about you? Yeah, um, I actually started doing lean innovation before I knew what lean innovation was at all. So I started at a startup um, back right out of college. And what I knew is that I really liked being strategic one moment and then also, you know, hands on the doing. And so I that kind of set the trajectory for my career. So even as I went into marketing and other jobs that in kind of typical corporate roles, I kept finding myself moving to those areas that where it was about creating something new. And so I did that through my marketing career and then that did get me to the Clay Street Project, which was all about innovation. And so um, it really, like Carl, it's very much suited to my personality. Um, and so as I've, you know, I really learned by doing and was doing it before I knew what the, the technical, you know, that this is what Lean Startup was, um, but it's really been a through line throughout my whole career. I've always sort of been the weird one um, in a large corporate organization. 
Yeah, I've heard that. Sometimes the most innovative people, I like that. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your slides, Carl. And then the next question I have for you is, let's start with defining lean innovation. A lot of us may have heard of it, maybe read a book, maybe not. So let's make sure we're on the same page. What is lean innovation? Is it the same as lean in a lean startup, which a lot of us have heard of? So uh, the, the, the bottom line answer to your question is yes, lean innovation. Um, comes from Lean Startup. We're going to um, talk about some details of that here in the coming minutes. So just as a background, um, obviously, as I, as I bring up uh, these brands, uh, these companies, there has been massive disruption in the last uh, particularly 10 years, but even the last 20 years. Um, entire industries have just been um, you know, either created or turned upside down. Um, with you know hundreds of companies, but of course these four clearly are very famous ones. So what does that mean for a company that's been around for uh, you know over 180 years, like a Procter and Gamble, in terms of do we uh, need to reinvent ourselves? What methodologies really work, and is that different for large enterprises as it is for startups or not? And so. What we've really come to learn is that um, historically, a company like Procter & Gamble had the luxury of, as it, as it grew its piles of cash, as it grew internationally, et cetera, it had the opportunity to grow through mergers and acquisitions. So that, you know, the big eating the small. But with the, um, you know, advent of uh, e-commerce, with uh, the, the mentality of startups really being so uh, hot and, and venture capital funding being so readily available, it's completely changed. And now it's very much around the fast eating the slow and you know we could go on for an hour just talking about case studies of that. But what we really wanna say is lean innovation, uh, again, it's uh, um, inspired by, by lean startup um, it's the same approach, it's the same mindset as a startup. So the startup mindset uh, can happen in your traditional startup in a large enterprise, but also I, I wanna note that this methodology, this mindset can be incredibly powerful uh, and sustaining in um, organizations that don't have revenue as well. Nonprofits um, are making huge strides um, by using lean innovation methodology and techniques as well. So a startup is an organization dedicated to creating something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And for those of us who are in large enterprises, um, demand planning, forecasting, uh, strategic planning are things that we're all very familiar with. And if you can't forecast something because it has no basis of history, that's really when you um, need to think about, okay, this is a startup. Um, I have extreme uncertainty, and so I need to think about how I proceed from here in the context of a startup. And just for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with uh, uh, innovation um, historically, if you have predictable conditions, that's referred to as sustaining innovation. Again, it's an, innova it's an innovation where you can forecast um, probable outcomes, which is, uh, you know, um, how a lot of large enterprises, even to this day, um, base their innovation portfolios. So it's organizing all of our e efforts as experiments um, with a very simple goal. And that is what part of our strategies are working and what parts aren't. Big bang kind of innovation um, used to be very, very popular. Um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, even into um, the 90s and 2000s in large enterprises. So can, uh, traditional market research, and then um, a lot of politics within companies around saying, okay, I've seen this before, um, I know what I'm doing, I have the most stripes on my shoulder, and so we're ready to spend um, huge amounts of innovation money. Um, we have consumer research, Unfortunately, though, traditionally, maybe hundreds or thousands of consumers, and there's um, studies that show that consumers want to please their researchers. So a lot of false reads, millions if not billions of dollars wasted 
um, because of the fact that there wasn't necessarily the right experimentation. So what is the right experimentation? So again, a consumer study can be very, very valuable, continues to be very, very valuable as it relates to understanding what the specific problem is that you're trying to solve by you know, solving that problem and creating a delightful experience for the consumer. That can be a B2C kind of experience. It can also be a B2B experience. I mean, think about IT applications and the difference between a positive and negative experience when you're a user of an IT application, right? So what the real difference here is, instead of the consumer talking just about if you do this, I will do that. You actually run experiments that are transactional. In other words, the consumer has uh, you know, skin in the game around needing to give something back in order to actually experience um, the use of, of the product. This generates a very, very different level of wealth of the learning that you receive, okay? So it, uh, a lot of times these transactional learning experiments do um, involve the consumer getting out their credit card um, or because a lot of the transactional learning that companies do is via uh, e-commerce. Um, but it also could be that you're in very early stages of this and you're simply trying to, uh, because of privacy, obviously they have to agree to give you their email address or they would need to agree to be on a user panel in the future. That's incredibly valuable and demonstrates interest for the consumer of that particular solution to the problem. So those are all examples of transactional learning that are so, so important um, for the company that is trying to uh, um, delight the consumer. So um, just like in the scientific method, you start with a hypothesis. In Lean Startup, uh, that's referred to as a leap of faith assumption. Um, and it's basically saying, we believe, I believe that if this is introduced, this will be the outcome, right? That's a hypothesis or a leap of faith. Um, and so again, transactional learning uh, is the best way to be able to get feedback that you can then use to determine what level of action you should be taking next. Um, and uh, I talked about those examples already. So. What are the key concepts of lean innovation? First of all, entrepreneurs are everywhere. Of course, you have your, your heroes uh, on the media, uh, entrepreneurs, but inside of your organization, whether that's for profit or not for profit, entrepreneurship um, in, internally uh, often called entrepreneurship is a mindset. It's a desire to be able to make a difference by making some kind of a disruption. Um, entrepreneurship is management. so whether it's in a startup or, or whether it's in an enterprise, these are predictable, repeatable, um, and sustainable um, capabilities as long as you put systems in place and, and you can continually improve on the results that you're getting uh, you know, by, by learning. And we're gonna talk about um, some of these methodologies here in the future. Validated learning. So, when I run an experiment, just like in the scientific method, I need to have a method uh, of, of saying, this is my goal, and I'm going to run the experiment to either validate or invalidate my leap of faith assumption or my hypothesis. Build, measure, learn is a cycle. It's a cycle of continual learning and a cycle of continual improvement that we'll talk about more here in the future. And then um, you have to know in your journey what you should be measuring. And um, innovation accounting, again, all of this, you can, you can see and learn about this uh, in books and, and many, many resources on the internet. But it's to get very, very clear on what you're trying to learn and therefore what metric KPI uh, people obviously talk about a lot um, is as, as, a, as a method, um, an overall uh, way of looking at metrics. Um, but you want to be careful not to jump to traditional KPIs early in your experimentation. Those can be uh, um, really useless if you're trying to simply answer a very specific question about a consumer behavior. So um, just quickly uh, to kind of say, okay, what is the fundamental overview of validated learning? You start with um, the suffering moment or the tension of the consumer. Uh, and 
you really want to be focused on your target demographic. You identify specific hypotheses around um, or, or leap of faith assumptions to say, okay, we're gonna run experiments to see if this happens, is this actually um, the outcome that comes from the consumer behavior? Um, you do that by focusing on the most important um, questions that need to be answered um, through a, a minimalistic design of what it is that you're trying to offer to the consumer to solve their problem. That's called a minimum viable product. Based on um, those design principles and um, having that available, you have specific learning metrics that's associated with this innovation accounting that I talked about. And then the outcome of those experiments would be that you either persevere because your current strategy is working, it's delivering the goals of the outcomes of the experiments that you're running, or you may need to pivot. Pivot is changing your strategy while maintaining the vision of what it is that you're fundamentally trying to do for the consumer. Or you may say, you know what, we've run enough experiments. The consumer doesn't seem to be interested, um, even if we're, though we're making pivots to our specific strategies. And therefore, the team ends that investment and, and you know, has the opportunity to take their learnings and move on to the next opportunity. Um, if you are working with a venture capitalist, I've never talked to a venture capitalist who isn't interested in the pitch deck talking about all of the elements of what's called the business model canvas. Again, the business model canvas is very uh, common in the ecosystem. All kinds of trainings available on business model canvas out there on the internet. So I won't jump into that um, in a lot of detail, but what it allows you to do is you're, is you're taking the journey from the initial idea to actually validating that, which is called product market fit, and, and then actually um, starting to, to pitch to get funding, uh, et cetera, et cetera, resources. You, you want to um, make sure that you're answering all the questions that are involved in the business model canvas. So what are some typical learning metrics that you would use when you're running experiments? Um, some of you that are involved in uh, work in e-commerce or frankly are uh, people who even participate as consumers in e-commerce, you're either providing the um, data that um, generates these metrics or you're setting specific targets and running experiments to make sure that th the targets associated with these metrics are being met. Um, and, and star rating probably is the most well-known, um, you know, the, the, the five star or, or one star rating. That's so incredibly important um, not only if you're in an e-commerce world, but even when you're trying to run experiments, because when a consumer is giving you something, let's say a two or a three, it really allows you then to double click with that consumer and say, what is it that's not meeting your expectations? So that's kind of a, a, a quick overview of what a Lean Startup is, um, you know, broadly in the ecosystem, also known as Lean Innovation. All right, great. Thank you so much. Karen, let's turn to you. Your work spans the entire Procter & Gamble organization. So even though Lean Startup and Lean Innovation are similar, how are things different or unique when you're dealing with such a large organization like Procter & Gamble? Yeah. Um, so as Carl mentioned, entrepreneurs are everywhere and there are actually a lot of entrepreneurs at P&G. And the important thing was um, how to unleash them. And so um, Carl, if you can move to the next slide. So um, getting people excited about it, right? We, had, we did a lot in the very beginning just to get everybody to understand what lean innovation was. And we went to the authors, right? Eric Reese, Steve Blank, they came out, we went out to them. Um, and that's a great place to start. But in a large organization to really operationalize, you need to understand what the barriers are and how to address those to really make change. So we partnered with a lot of external folks. Um, the two people on, on the slide from uh, Bionic were our primary partners. We brought external folks in so that we could learn from them. And then we also learned across all the different business units. So we approached this in a lean innovation way to say, we don't know exactly how to do this. Our big experiment is how do you bring lean innovation to PNG? And with that experiment, we used all the tools that Carl just mentioned in order to operationalize it. 
And what we found is that there were kind of three elements that we needed in order for it to really work. So the first was learning like an entrepreneur. And that's everything Carl just talked about, about how about the learning loops, falling in love with the consumer, being really focused on critical leap of faith assumptions, and then that build, measure, learn cycle. Um, at a big company, you don't have the problem that startups have, which is that they don't have any money. We have a lot of money. So you actually have to really teach people to create MVPs, multiple, you know, minimal viable products to learn fast. And that's really been a learning curve for many people. So that's step one, and it is necessary but not sufficient in a large organization. We had to change how we resourced and how we organized as well. And so what we learned is that we needed to look more at, to invest in our projects the way that venture capitalists do, which is to be really clear on what you're trying to do with an overall portfolio, placing lots of bets, a lot of little ideas, and go really, really fast to vet them and learn what doesn't work so that you can then invest in what does. And that's a fundamental shift that is different than, as Carl mentioned, how you would approach sustaining innovation. And then the third piece was creating what we called an ecosystem to really um, foster that entrepreneurial spirit in the founders. So we called our team's founders to help really drive home what their job was, which was to create startups within the big company. And it really takes a very different organization to, um, to have that come to life. So those are the three components. And I can um, talk through an example. Uh, yeah, I think we had the example of the Charmin Freedom Roll, right? We'd love yeah. to hear about that. Yeah, so um, some of you might be familiar. This is at market right now. It is a, like you see, a really large roll of toilet paper almost freakishly large. And uh, the founder who did this said, you know what, if we had just des designed this in a conference room, we ne this never would have gotten out of, out of market because we would have said, who would, who would want such a thing? Well, a lot of people actually want such a thing. And, and they found that out through going through this process. So the first, again, that build, measure, learn, um, learning cycle is they went to their consumer and they did a lot of ethnography. And they, um, ethnography means that you go into where people live and you observe how they live. And they found that people in small spaces um, hid their toilet paper, like they had nowhere to put it, right? It was like under the bed, in the oven, all over the place. And because no, we, none of us want to run out of toilet paper, right? That's a kind of base need. So they said, okay, how do we solve this problem? And their first MVP was actually a electronic counter right, that would track how much toilet paper you're using and then order it for you. And they thought that was a great idea. And the consumers were like, nope, not a good idea. So cheap, discovered that, moved on to the next thing. They kept trying different ones. And this idea of a large roll of toilet paper kept coming up. So they said, okay, and they, and they made it. And then they found out that it doesn't fit on any, you know, anybody's wall. So they had to do the separate stand and they thought for sure that nobody's going to pay for that. They tested it just like Carl had showed about they put it online, they had the price and people bought it. So continually they found things that they weren't really sure would work. They put it in front of the consumer and the consumer purchased it and it kept building from there. And so it has grown into a, a large online business and, and is moving into storage now. So that's an example kind of the, that build, measure, learn. And then in terms of how they made it through the system and that idea of investing like a venture capitalist, um, honestly, in the early days, making that thing, so Carl a, is a PS guy. He would know all the details of making that thing. I'm a marketer. I, even I knew that you can't make that big roll of toilet paper on the same thing that makes the little roll of toilet paper, right? So before making those kinds of investments, they had to agree with their leaders who served like their venture capitalists. You, this is the data that you need to show me that there's enough consumer need here before I'm going to spend the money to make is going to be able to make that kind of toilet paper. And so that's how they moved down the funnel is it was a constant back and forth leadership team conversation of this is the data I have to in order to get the metered funding to go to the next step. And then lastly, organizationally, that ecosystem, they started with just one team. It was actually two very senior and um, experienced, a marketing person and, a re and an R&D research and development person. And they said, you've got you know, a small amount of money. We support you. Go 
figure it out. And so they had the founders, they had some sponsors that looked out for them as well as helped bring in resources that they needed. And they had their venture capitalists, their leaders who gave them meter funding. And so that's kind of how it all comes together in a big company. Great, thank you. I love that example. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a couple slides here. If you, Carl, could just uh, scroll through them slowly so we can see yeah. them. And the slides will be sent out as well as the recording, so you can look at them later. Um, Carl, I think you um, also had another example about the Zevo brand. Can you tell us about that and, and how you applied some of that build, measure, learn method to that example? Yeah, I sure will. Um, so Zevo is a insect kill product um, that's available at uh, Target, Walmart, um, Home Depot, uh, and what is disruptive about Zevo is there is no poison. And so fundamentally, uh, what's so critical for consumers is consumers um, traditionally have had their insecticide out in the garage on a top shelf because they don't want uh, it near their, uh, their children. A lot of consumers don't participate in the um, insect kill space because uh, they, they don't want their pets to be uh, at, at risk of being around poison. And Zevo doesn't have any poison. The way Zevo works is um, our, uh, we worked with a partner um, that had found that um, there is a way to be bioselective with insects. Effectively, that means insects um, brains are these receptors um, that um, can be disrupted, that causes their death through um, a non-toxic uh, methodology, basically essential oils. Hmm. And so the, 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 the formula that has a, a number of, um, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, secret ingredients, uh, they're all revolving around a um, essential oil. And that uh, allows Zevo to be extremely effective in killing insects, but being completely harmless with uh, humans, uh, pets, children, uh, you know, of course, children are humans too. Um, that's really the breakthrough um, that uh, makes Zevo um, a very fast growing and successful uh, product. So, Zevo was born in Procter & Gamble Ventures, which is a uh, business unit inside of P&G that is entirely culturally, uh, organizationally uh, focused on lean startup, lean innovation. And um, so it started with uh, the specific uh, hypothesis around uh, you can have a, a safe and effective insect uh, product. And, uh, you know, Procter & Gamble, as do many other large enterprises as well as startups, we do a lot of partnering in the ecosystem, a lot of searching in the ecosystem for partners. We identify unmet consumer needs and we do searching and find partners and find ways, not just inside of our company, but more and more external um, to the company to find um, solutions that delight consumers. So a hypothesis um, e example, for Zevo early on was because of the target consumer, the hypothesis was that most consumers uh, would be buying Zevo online. We uh, um, ran um, more, you know, larger and larger experiments associated with that. And even though um, the target demographic is, is um, a bit younger, what we found was those consumers still are interested in uh, using traditional uh, bricks and mortar retail to buy a product like Zevo um, that they're using regularly. And, um, it, you know, that's uh, where we made a pivot. In other words, a change in strategy without a change in vision to being more focused on developing um, the retail trade um, channels um, and, and, and scaling via the retail trade channels versus scaling um, um, exclusively or, or primarily in, um, uh, in e-commerce. And um, so where, where does uh, Zevo go from here? Um, as th it stays focused on the vision of providing safe and effective uh, insect control, you can imagine um, additional experiments that the Zevo team is running around meeting other less than fully met uh, consumer needs. 
um, but always against that mantra of safe and effective. Um, a couple of other things to mention here, um, specifically around build, measure, learn. Zevo again, didn't come to the party like a lot of uh, PNG research, let's say um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, would have been, okay, we have a solution, now we have to go find a problem to solve. It was very much around saying, we're hearing from consumers that um, th they don't even participate in the category because they simply don't want to accept poison in their home. And so the Zevo brand staying completely focused on that consumer need um, allowed the experiments to stay focused, the creation of the minimum viable product to stay focused, and um, you know, looking for a partner to stay focused. And uh, so that, that build, measure, learn cycle uh, of, of continual learning, of continual improvement is extremely effective. But if you, if you lose sight of being in love with the consumer and their problem, you lose a lot of time, you lose a lot of resource uh, um, investment because you've, you've, you've lost your, your focus on what it is you're trying to do for that consumer. Uh, another thing I wanna mention around passing, pivoting, or persevering um, is you, you wanna make sure that you are using um, scorecard methodologies you have very clear um, expectations set up with what um, in the ecosystem are called growth boards um, around what would be the criteria to uh, justify a pivot. How, 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 much, how much experimentation do we wanna do between adjusting and saying, okay, we really need to fundamentally change our strategy or particularly related to passing, um, but you, know, you don't wanna get into what's called a voodoo uh, initiative, um, in other words, one where it's uh, kind of sitting there and, and just has a life of its own vers versus really using the data to say, okay, we've learned that um, either the, the, the leap of, of innovation that would have to take place to deliver this unmet consumer need uh, is simply not an investment we're willing to make or the consumer is just not interested in our solution. You, you need to make sure that your growth board is really helping the founders to identify the success criteria for when a pass makes sense. Great, awesome, thank you so much. Um, Karen, let's turn back to you and tell us a little bit more about GrowthWorks and you have a mantra, growth works every day. Um, and then also, how does GrowthWorks collaborate with the rest of the organization, including P&G Ventures and all the business work, all the business units? Yeah. So GrowthWorks began um, first and foremost to help with disruptive innovation, and in that role, we, the GrowthWorks team, a very small um, corporate team, partnered with each of and continues to partner with each of the business uni units, including um, Ventures to really help them set up the ecosystem that they needed. And then we provide a lot of capability. So we provide not only training, but there are also just uh, capabilities, different tools, research tools, a lot of um, uh, systems that help you uh, sell small. All of those types of things is what we provide at a corporate level. And every one of the business units actually runs their own, um, what they call a growth works organization. As Carl mentioned, uh, Ventures was all growth works. In every other category, they have a section of their organization which they call growth works, or some of them have other names, um, but they all do the same thing. They focus on disruptive innovation and they use the growth works me methodology to deliver that disruptive innovation. Now, once we started bringing this, uh, these tools and methodology through the company, a lot of people saw, hey, can help everyday work too, because as Carl mentioned, the, the benefit of these tools is in uh, times of uncertainty and in innovation times are really uncertain. But in today, <laughs> today is uncertain, right? We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. So um, what we found is that um, 
people are able to take these tools and use them. So for example, um, becoming really obsessed with the consumer problem versus the solution, um, which we have a tendency to do, that can help everyone because the consumer isn't just the end user, it could be your boss, it could be your internal work group that you're working with. And so we find once we started really training the larger organization, people in HR, people in finance, they use these same tools in order to stay super focused on who are we serving and then they also started to run experiments right prioritizing what are the leap of faith assumptions writing down some metrics and running experiments and so we find that throughout the organization now people are using these tools for example when covid first hit and we needed to make uh, shields for to keep our employees safe in the plants they use this process in order to very quickly create something that we've never created before and so that's kind of how we it's it's um expanded throughout the company um even if they don't have let's say any kind of organizational difference what we find is that people are still using the same principles of working in a small team trying to be as fully dedicated as they they can be like hey let's all work together on friday afternoons um so that they can have that element of what you have in the more um, full ecosystem of disruptive innovation and using growth works great thank you so much well it must have been a real challenge to to lead all this change um changing minds and and human behavior so i'm wondering what are let's start with you again karen what are two or three tips you have for our audience about how to facilitate this kind of change organization-wide? Yeah, so for us, um, and actually you don't have to put the slide on, <laughs> Carl, sorry. Um, for us, it was really, um, number one, it was about leadership. So uh, our um, head of R&D, research and development, and our head of marketing were really leading this from the very beginning. And it, it was a critical not only in any culture change, having the leaders um, be the beacon is important. But what was really important for this for Lean Innovation was that partnership between the technical and the commercial side, because ultimately innovation is a team sport and we needed multifunctional skills. So seeing them lead it together, they showed up together externally when they talked about it internally, that consistency set the tone for everything. The second thing was this consistent language. So um, the, the frameworks that I showed you, um, honestly, as somebody who's a bit skeptical of, of, of big company stuff, I was like, oh, we're kind of, we're proctorizing it. We're making it too much. You know, we're taking the fun out of it. But really, for when you've got a large organization, you need something that's orienting. So having consistent frameworks and language was really key. Um, and then the third thing, and I mentioned this before, but it's probably the biggest uh, influencer was that we did what we were what we were what we were telling other people to do. We ran this like an experiment with everything that we put out. Nothing was like some big thing that we deployed. We looked at what the biggest problems were that our business units were having. We tried something out. We learned from it, and we continued to iterate. And I think that's been um, what what's been so helpful. Great, Carl, let's go back to you. And I'll remind people, um, do put your questions. Uh, there's a Q&A function in the chat, so you can drop your questions in there and we'll transition to that. Carl, what advice do you have for either current leaders or in a, people who would like to be innovation leaders in the, in the future? Well, first and foremost, take advantage of the wealth of uh, resources that are available out uh, in, in, the, in the ecosystem. Um, you know, when people reach out to me, the very first th question I ask them is, have you read um, Eric Reese's books? You know, another uh, uh, source of amazing, um, more fundamental uh, uh, information is Clayton Christensen. Uh, the Innovator's Dilemma is still an incredibly timely uh, book. Um, and then that reaches kind of all the way up to, you know, Karen was talking about some of these elements, um, but having um, the, your culture, having your leadership, um, having people educated on what it is that you're trying to, um, what problem you're trying to solve organizationally. Um, there's been some you know, specific um, learnings that not only have we had, but you know, these are very common learnings uh, across um, the ecosystem because what we obviously do a lot of benchmarking and collaborating to make sure that 
um, you know, what, what Procter & Gamble is doing is, um, you know, the best practices. Cool. And Carl, you had, some, you had some other thoughts about leadership as well. Some slides I really liked about teams lead and leaders learn. Do you want to share yeah. that? Yeah. So I'll let Karen go first here um, just about um, some, some of those reflections that we have. Yeah, I think one of the big pieces when you're leading innovation is you do need to be very curious. You need to create psychological safety because you want your teams to come with failures. In, you know, we did this experiment and it didn't work out. We want to tell you that so that we learn the next thing. So we began by telling, talking about mindsets and all of these things. And we found that that's a little bit ethereal and that being really clear, then this using this mantra really helped people that the teams lead and the reason they lead is because they're closest to the consumer they've got the consumer data and we want the market or the consumer to tell us what to do next and inform us actually not tell us so they're going to inform us usually we have to do the strategy but they're going to inform us what they need so the teams lead leaders learn and we gave um, both the teams and the leaders these questions and this comes from agile scrum actually um, and it was a really easy way to help people make a bit of a mindset shift that the leader's job was not to tell the teams what to do, but to listen and say, how can I help you learn? And so this is really grounded in growth mindset, which we also do a lot of effort around at PNG. So it, it, it synergized really well, but it was also very, um, I would say, tangible way to help shift uh, leaders and teams mindsets about what the relationship uh, it would need to be. Great. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to uh, add, literally just earlier this week, um, P&G presented at the Barclays Consumer Staples Conference, Investor Conference, and I, I was reading the uh, <clears throat> presentation and I thought that this quotation really was relevant to our discussion today. Um, and this is, Karen talked about uh, mindset. So constructive disruption, a willingness to change, adapt, create new trends, technologies that will shape our future for the future. So, a uh, again, Procter is over 180 years old. There's a lot of consumer products companies, a lot of B2B industry. But even if you think about technology, there has to be a mindset of constructive disruption that is constant in enterprises because there, every morning there's a startup, um, you know, somewhere waking up saying, we're, we're, we're going to overtake that market. We're going to we're going to do a better job delighting that consumer or that customer than the incumbents. And so this this mindset is inherent in Procter & Gamble. And I think um, if, if you look at the fact that after all these years, that company continues to be very successful, it, it centers around um, this kind of a mindset. And um, at the operational level, um, just super quickly, We've thought about traditional behaviors. We've, again, looked at um, through benchmarking what's really making the biggest difference. And this is this cultural shift, only having the necessary meeting in the room. You've probably all heard about the one and two pizza team kind of thinking, running experiments, um, having a time boundary around um, the concept in Agile Scrum uses this concept a lot of learning sprints two to four weeks, go get the answer. You don't need more than two to four weeks if you're using the real focused minimum viable product um, and, and expecting people to not be in functional silos, but you're part of this small team. We're gonna use your skills. We're not gonna use your title. So those are kind of the, um, the, the key aspects of that. And you know, kind of in summary, uh, as we said, at the end of the day, the, 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 the way, regardless of what kind of an organization that you're in, you have to recognize that it's now about speed, it's about leveraging uh, the organization capabilities that you have. And most importantly, I would say as a shift for Procter & Gamble, it's been about becoming a dramatically more externally focused company um, that really is now doing a, a, a pretty good job, obviously can always be better, but a pretty good job starting to become an active uh, um, and dependent member of the ecosystem. Great, awesome. Well, we will start with questions now, Corey. You can stop sharing your screen if you want and then people can see us a little bit larger. Um, I do have two questions. 
in the in the Q and A already, and um, I'm going to invite that person to the stage. If we don't hear from you, we'll assume maybe you're not able to come to the stage, and I'll ask your question. Um, but first, uh, Professor Kersner Allen, would you like to come up? I think Lindsay will invite you. And also, while we're waiting, Lindsay will be putting that um, that survey link in the chat. So we would love to get your feedback on the event. Hey there, Professor Kersner. Hello. He so uh, Alan yeah. teaches uh, Lean Startup, so his, his question, he's very knowledgeable about this area. Yeah, yeah. Car Carl and Karen, thanks. I have to tell you, I, I do teach Lean Startup, and I became part of Proctor with the RVI acquisition ah. back in uh, 85, I believe. And I think you answered this, Karen, but my question was, who really initiated and gain support from Lean Startup organization-wide. You mentioned uh, head of R&D and head of marketing, but I assume it took someone even above them to really institute it as an institutional priority. Yeah, so, so Kathy Fish and Mark Pritchard, who are R&D and, and marketing counterparts, really were the, the leading force. But David Taylor, our CEO um, at the time, really um, was a believer in innovation and also shepherded it as well. So from a, you know, financing it and as well as talking about it, he definitely led as well. So um, it came from the top. Our presidents, so our categories um, are each led by a, a, um, a CEO president. They also... Um, most of them are very, um, I would say, very experienced in innovation. So it wasn't a hard sell necessarily. I think through the rest of the organization, it's been a little bit harder um, than at the, at the very top. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Our next question is um, also from Professor uh, Rob Williams. Rob, would you like to come up to the stage? I'll give Lindsay a moment to make that happen. All right, well, I'll, uh, while we are waiting potentially for Rob, I'll ask. Oh, there he is. Oh, great. Yeah. Hi, good morning. And Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both for being here. I'm, uh, like Carl, a uh, recent retiree from a major corporation and bringing the innovation story to Temple Fox. Um, my, my, so I teach uh, a different course, the strategic uh, management course in innovation. And we actually, every term, track Procter & Gamble's open innovation and what exactly they're asking for um, every half year. And what we noticed is there are some new activities that have emerged. Um, there's a Life Lab and a Spark Beauty Ventures. And we get into this discussion about, you, you know, do you, do you put these kind of innovation groups in the main operating divisions or do you do these breakaway specialized units. And so the question is why why these special units and, and why not leave them in the product groups? Can yeah. I go first? Yeah, I can start. So um, one of the things when we did GrowthWorks is we said we were not going to mandate how the business units do it, right? So every business unit has created their own, I would call it sub business unit. So for hair, the Sparks Beauty Venture is within beauty. Um, that's where they do their disruptive innovation. And what we've just discovered, and um, we didn't just discover it, we've rediscovered it. Clay Christensen said it probably originally, right? You do need to have that separation or else you'll always be pulled to the core, right? You're everybody's resources. So we have at the highest level, at the category level, um, both organizations report up so that it is a beauty led organization or a fabric care led organization but then um, they do separate to make sure that the resources and the focus is on disruptive innovation. So though, though Sparks Beauty Ventures is out there, every business unit has something like that. Um, Life Lab is actually our CES. It's kind of an external facing um, group that showcases all of P&G. So they're, they're a little bit of a, of a different piece. And, I don't, and then Carl, maybe you wanna talk about how PG Ventures is a little bit even different than that. Yeah, and so, if I want to use an analogy here, um, if you think about innovation overall being your dinner and the choice that you've made is that you have lean innovation as your dinner is a stew, then these aspects that we're adding 
are the ingredients of the stew. And so the ingredients of the stew over time may make uh, sense to include in the stew, or they may be something that we end up taking out of the stew. So Life Lab, as an example, which is something I had an opportunity to be part of um, prior to my retirement, <clears throat> there are some technologies there that, you know, two years ago, zero people in Procter & Gamble had any knowledge of. And so, you know, again, very small teams, very nimble, um, focused, learning, 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 partnering. Um, and two years from now, will the metaverse matter to Procter & Gamble? Probably, but who knows? And so um, we are able to make these investments through small focused teams who can learn very quickly, who can run experiments independently and not be part of the bureaucracy uh, uh, that any large corporation has. And if it doesn't work, it's not such a big deal. We've learned, we move on to the next ingredient of the stew. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I would like to ask one though, and then in just a moment, we'll move back to the networking tables. And I believe each of the speakers is able to stick around for a few minutes to network with you. Uh, but my question is, of the persevere, pivot, or pass, it seems like pivot and persevere people can get behind, but the pass, I imagine, would create some consternation, maybe some conflict. So is that the case, and how do you manage that? Karen, ladies first. Sure. Um, so yes, pass is the most difficult thing. Um, and it, I think it is something that uh, has taken some time and, 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 and we're getting better at it as a company. Um, because I, I think in the very first round of starting to do the GrowthWorks approach, people just wanted to get, I would say, used to doing it and trying to get something out there. But the truth is, is that it's not about good. It's about getting the greatest things out there. And so you have to feel comfortable to pass. One of the things that um, has helped is being really vocal, is having leaders be really vocal about how great it is if a team comes forward and says they want to pass and to actually reward them for passing and uh, showing how that saved a lot of money because keeping things alive is not good for innovation and it's not good for morale and it's not good for your bottom line if you know it's not gonna move forward. So it's definitely a journey, but celebrating that this is what we want to do because we're not going for good, we're going for great has helped quite a bit. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add to that is we've talked about growth boards a couple of times um, today. Um, it is so important for any organization that's going to use lean innovation to recognize that how you interact with your founder teams, how the kinds of questions that you ask, what servant leadership looks like, but then very specifically, if you're thinking about a VC, which is again, in a, in a large enterprise, your growth board is your VC, right? A VC is not gonna keep writing checks for a zombie. And so for a startup, this is not nearly as hard because the VC simply says, we're done, okay? But um, so, so the leadership behavior, the, I talked a little bit about having success, very, very clear success criteria. It's so important in a large enterprise to have the right people and the right success criteria being driven by them by your growth board. Great, thank you so much.